Good morning. Let's all stand up and worship the Lord together. Welcome to Pathfinder Church and welcome to this time of worship. We come here today, just like we sang, we come here to meet with God. To meet with God. And what that means is that this time, this hour that we spend in church is, is a lot different from a lot of the other things that we do throughout the week. We come here as individuals, but then we come together and we form the body of Christ in God's holy presence here to worship him. And that's what we're doing here. And as we come and as we prepare our hearts to worship, what we're asking today is we're asking that God would purify us, that God would look on us as sinners and forgive us, and that God would make us holy. Listen to these words from Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let's say that all together. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's our prayer, that God creates in each one of us a clean heart. A clean heart so that we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, which is what we're going to do right now. If you're joining us online, worship with us. Leave a comment below. Say hi. Let us know that you're here. Let's go before God and worship him together. In the world 
Amen. Please have a seat. Hello, everyone. Here are the things that you need to know about that are happening in the life of Pathfinder Church. And the very first one is that fantasy football is starting very, very soon. We actually, um, the deadline for letting me know if you're interested or if you have any questions at all is going to be this Wednesday, the 24th. So if you have any questions at all, let me know. Or if you're interested, let me know. And if you have signed up already, I will be reaching out sometime this week to give the details about how we're going to move forward with it. The next thing that I have for us is our color clash is this next week. Believe it or not, this is next week is the last Sunday of the summer. And we're going to ring it in with a, a really amazing time. So if you have any 6th through 12th graders, have them come out. We're going to have an amazing time. And it's just going to be so much fun and a great way to kick off the school year. Next thing that I have for you is our final all-church cookout of the summer. Man, that's a theme here, that summer's coming to a close, right? Is today after this service. So come downstairs, or no, we're going to be outside. Um, we're going to have burgers and hot dogs. We're going to have food to pass around, and it's just going to be an, an incredible time of community and hanging out with each other. So please join us right after the service. Next thing that I have for you is our Better Together. That's going to be September 11th. It's going to be a combined service at 1030, so that doesn't change the time that you guys are here. Um, but we're going to be combined, and it's going to be such a fun time of, of being one in Pathfinder Church. Not first service, second service, but just Pathfinder Church together. And before that, we're going to be serving you breakfast. So come in early for that. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to load you up on carbs before you get to come into worship. And then our final pizza at the playground for this summer is this Wednesday. It's been such an incredible time throughout this summer to watch the kids have fun together, but also watch parents make connections too. So come out to that one. Um, it's a great way to, to have kids burn off energy and to not cook dinner for that evening. So come out this Wednesday at 530. And then I have one final announcement for you that doesn't have a slide, but you may or may not have noticed on your way in, we have a packet and this little card that we want to hand out. So the packet is just an update on the, the church's financial situation just to inform you on what's going on. Um, so take a look at that if you can. And then um, we have this little pledge card that I want you to take a look at too. And all the information for both of these things is in the packet. So if you didn't grab one on the way in, please grab one on the way out. And let's continue with our worship service today. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, it's been a morning already. All right. So last week, I started a little mini-series about back to school. Pastor Jake was just telling us school starts next week. Ooh. Anyway, so we talked about worry and all the things that we don't need to worry about uh, when we start school. But today, I want to talk about kindness when, it, when we're talking about going back to school especially kindness with our words. Because that's a really important thing. When we go to school, we want to show kindness and protect our hearts, our friends' hearts. We want them to stay clean and fresh. We, we just said a, a Bible verse that wasn't planned, but uh, Steve shared a Bible verse, create in us a clean heart. My heart is very clean. The Bible tells us in the book of John, verse 15, or excuse me, chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I, meaning God, have loved you. Now, when we go to school, <clears throat> and maybe we, we uh, come across some people who say mean words, they do mean things, and they crush our heart and make it not so clean anymore. Or maybe we say mean things to somebody else and crush their heart. You know, it's really, really hard to make my heart, this is hard to do with a microphone in my hand, it's hard to make my heart fresh and clean anymore. 
So what I want you to remember is when you go to school next week, that maybe we say kind words to the people that we don't know very well, or maybe to the friends that we haven't seen in a while, instead of saying the mean words that wrinkle our hearts. This also applies maybe at home, too, to your siblings or to your mom and dad. Sometimes it's hard to say nice words when our family members make us angry, but we want clean hearts, not wrinkled hearts, right? So think about that as we head back to school. I got one more lesson for you next week talking about back to school. Have a great week. This is my next to the last Sunday for the summer to talk about giving. <laughs> I don't know if some of you saw this, but it happened uh, late in the month of July, uh, just about a month ago. There was a church service going on in Brooklyn in the borough of New York City there, and they were live streaming the service, and the pastor was into the sermon, and he's preaching away, and all of a sudden he stops, and he looks up, and in the video live feed, you see him suddenly hit the floor just flat out right down there on the, on, the, on, the, you know, on the floor and like, what's going on? And then into the picture frame comes live feed. There were three men who walked through the door of the church all wearing their kind of dark uh, outfits and carrying guns. And there you see it right in live, you know, live time. Uh, they're, they're holding up the church. Now they came looking for jewelry. That's what they wanted. And so they took from the pastor and from the pastor's spouse, their jewelry. Nobody else got robbed, just the pastor and his spouse. <laughs> and then it came out why they were there interested in the pastor's jewelry. The jewelry between the pastor and his spouse was worth $1 million. They were dressed good that Sunday, and uh, somebody knew it, I guess. Check with Brother Don and Miss Jackie this morning, and they, they are not approaching any threshold of, <laughs> of any kind. I tell you that story not only because it's true, but I also tell it to you because, you know, I'm grateful that we get to come into this church and share experiences that are worth more than all the money on the planet. I do not believe you could put a price tag on the value and the worth of being with the people of God in a worship setting where we sing our praises unto the Lord, where we have moments to pray for each other. There are moments before and after service that we get to be with each other, and sometimes we shed some tears for each other with some of the things of life. And other times we get to put smiles on our faces and laugh because God is blessed in ways that just bring joy. You can't by relationships that count in your life and matter. Just the same way, anything and everything that I give to my church makes a powerful difference in keeping this place healthy and alive that we all might have the most valuable of all things, a relationship with God in each other. Let's pray. There are ways in which we can give, O oh God, but we pray that it's always out of a glad heart, out of a sense of your abundance and your provisions. The God you provide for us, what we need, when it is needed, that we can lean on each other and know in this family that here is something that money cannot buy. It is the relationships that we have because of what you've done for us in Jesus our Savior. So we give you our thanks, God, for our church. We give you our thanks for all of your churches where your message, where your scriptures are being taught and lifted up. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship by singing, and I'd like to invite you all to stand up as we sing. We're going to be listening to a message in just a minute, and this song is to prepare us to call on God and to prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord. Let's sing together. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant.
be seated. Good morning, beloved. Glad to be here with you all. Glad to be with you that are online with us uh, this morning. And for those of you who will be with us later on in the week, whatever time of the day it is, we're glad to have you with us as well. We are continuing on in our sermon series, now a month and a half long, uh, called In the Grip of Grace. In the Grip of Grace. And today I want to talk about, uh, the sermon title is The Privilege of Paupers. The Privilege of Paupers. Now, pauper is, is not a word we use very much anymore, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the text that we're going to use is Romans chapter 5. Uh, so we're picking up right where we left off, Romans chapter 5 and uh, 6 through 10. So here they are. This is really important. When we were utterly helpless, 
Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. The text, uh, again, it may not be readily obvious, our theme, but it, I think it will grow uh, as, we, as we go through the sermon. Our, our theme for this morning is this, as paupers, which presumes then that we all must be so, as paupers, we are adopted into God's family. As paupers, we are adopted into God's family. So last week, uh, right after I finished this service, uh, I, I, I finished the, and I, I had announced the sermon title for this week, The Privilege of Paupers. And as I was uh, walking out, uh, someone grabbed a hold of me and, and said to me, uh, Brother Don, what do you mean by a pauper? And, and so I, I shared with that person. But I guess the first thing, it would be important, that's, again, Jake, it's not a, a word we use a lot, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Here's, here's the dictionary.com definition. Okay, dictionary.com says this. A pauper is a person without any means of support, especially a destitute person who depends on aid from public welfare funds or charity, a very poor person. Now, that's, um, that's a good definition of a pauper. If you're looking at this from a, a societal standpoint or from cultural standpoint, a point of view, um, but that doesn't really help us too much um, biblically and more importantly, theologically. That, that definition doesn't help us at all. So I, I'd like to give us a more of a biblical, theological perspective on what a pauper is. And so here is my definition of pauper. It comes right out of the text from today, and it's your first fill in the blank in your notes today. It says this, in God's kingdom, a pauper is one who is utterly helpless. Those words ought to look familiar. A sinner and his, that is God's enemy. Okay. So the, the pauper is one who is utterly helpless, a sinner, and God's enemy. All right? And again, that definition comes right out of the text that we just read a moment ago. I'm going to put it back up there for you now so we can look at it again. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were all still his enemies. So there's all those words in the definition right there in that text. Okay? So what does it mean? What does it mean to be a pauper? Okay? In the eyes of God, theologically, understanding that. Well, here's, here's what it is. It means in God's eyes, there is nothing we can do to save ourselves from our human condition. We are destitute without God in our lives. Okay? Nothing we can do. We are sinners. We are enemies of God as we learned last week in our sermon. And there, there is, and, and I used this, this kind of metaphor last week, there's a great big wide gulf between God and us human beings, and someone has to bridge that gulf, All right? And, and I stood here in the form of a cross for that reason, because that's what bridges the gulf, the cross of Calvary, all right? So why am I telling us all this again? Why am I repeating it again? Well, because it's true about every single one of us. It's true about all of us, including this here pastor. We are all paupers in the eyes of God. That is, until we acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior. We were and are dependent upon God. Uh, not public welfare or charity, although some of us certainly are dependent upon that, but that's a societal definition. We are dependent upon God. God is the only one who can help us with our sinfulness. And it is the privilege of us paupers to find ourselves in the grip of God's grace and adopted into his family, or team as we called it last week in our, in our metaphors, right? 
And we are so privileged. Well, how do we, how do we get this privilege? That's the question. The privilege comes because God made promises to us, because God promised us something. So I want to use a biblical example. Uh, this is the story of King David and a young man named Mephibosheth. Say that fast three times, quickly. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. Oh, look at that. I could do it. We're going to use that to help us understand this grace and these promises that God has made for us. So your second fill in the blank today is this. The promise of the king brings grace. The promise of the king brings grace. And we're going to start the story with the friendship of Jonathan and David. Okay? Friendship of Jonathan and David. And this is Jonathan talking to David in this text, 1 Samuel 20 here. And may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan is asking David, who has been anointed but is not yet king, okay? Jonathan is asking David to please be kind to his, to his family if he should die. Continue to be, you know, good friends with Jonathan, but if he should die, please be faithful and good to his family. And David makes that promise, right? In that moment, David says, this I will do, okay? He makes a promise to Jonathan and his family. They were best of friends, BFFs, okay? And, and Jonathan had saved David's life at one time as well. So when David became king, he wanted to honor his promise that he had made, all right? Both Jonathan and Saul had been killed in battle, unfortunately. So and, and do you remember Saul? Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel, and Saul quite frankly, wanted David dead. I mean, Saul was not, uh, initially he was very kind towards David, but, but then uh, he became very jealous of him. He knew that, he, that uh, David had been anointed to be king, and Saul did not like him after that, and Saul literally tried to kill him a couple different times. And as I said, Jonathan uh, saved him. And you, could, you can certainly say that Saul was the enemy of David, although David did not want Saul to be his enemy, uh, David wanted to honor him and, and, and treat him well as the king, but it, it just didn't work out that way. Anyway, if, if, if you don't know the whole story, go back and read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. That will help you with the whole story. In fact, I encourage you to do that anyway um, as, we, as we study this uh, text. So Saul was Jonathan's father. Jonathan was Mephibosheth's father. Look at 2 Samuel 4, 4 here. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. So what happens? Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. They knew that someone else was, had already been anointed to be king, right? And so Saul's family, they're, they're running. They're running away. Uh, and the nurse finds out that, that the king had been killed, that Jonathan had been killed. She's running away. She picks up little five-year-old Meshivlatheth, and she starts running out the door. And when she gets outside, she drops him by accident and crushes both his legs, and he is crippled for the rest of his life, okay, as she's trying to run away and save his life. So that's what happens. And so you have to, the other thing you have to understand is the times that, that we're talking about here. Uh, in order to understand this, we have to understand the culture that David lived in. When a new king would take over, okay, when a new king would take over, the typical thing to do, if, if it was a different family, the, different, the typical thing to do was for the, old king, or for the new king to kill off all of the old king's family. I mean, that's just the way it was, gang. Whether we like it or not doesn't matter. That's the way it was. That's the truth of the times. So the new king coming in, he would wipe out the old king's family. That's just the way things were. And, and, and you, you can actually see that it, that happens a lot through time. Go look at the history of Great Britain. Uh, you'll see that a lot. Um, and it still happens in this world today, some places, some regimes, where you know if a new regime comes in, they'll kill off everybody from the old one. Uh, it just happens. It's, it's terrible, but it is. So here is... Mephibosheth, 
I can't even say it, Mephibosheth, who is the grandson of the one who wanted to kill David. Okay, you got to remember that. He is the grandson of the one who wanted to kill David. So again, David wants to keep his promise to Jonathan, though, because they were such dear friends, and he made this promise. So he inquires one day about any remaining family members of Saul and Jonathan. There it is right there. So one day David asks, is anyone in Saul's family alive, anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, this is really unusual, what David says here. I want to show kindness to Saul's family. All right? This is the kind of question that someone asks who themselves has been in the grip of grace. Can't I do something for somebody? I need to be kind to others because I have felt the kindness of the king. David remembers when he was once weak and needed help. David remembers running through the cave, from cave to cave to cave, hiding because Saul wanted him dead. David remembers Jonathan's friendship and, and safety and treatment of him. David remembers all the times that God Almighty spared him through all those years when he was being chased. And I couldn't help but think, doesn't that sound a lot like our text for today? When we were utterly helpless, when David was utterly helpless, Jonathan came to his rescue. God Almighty came to his rescue. Now think about us. When we were utterly helpless, we couldn't get out of our sins, our fallen nature, Christ came to save us. That was God's promise from the very beginning, that he would redeem his people, that he would redeem those who had faith in him. And that's what we see in this text. So the next question we get to ask about is, is what about this Mephibosheth? Have you ever heard of him before? How many, how many people have ever heard of him? Just a few of you. Okay, well, more than a few. All right, very good. All right. He's not one of those characters that gets a lot of glory in the Scripture. I mean, let's just face it. Um, he, you know, we don't write Sunday school lesson plans about him. We don't have Bible studies about him, typically, right? Um, he might show up every now and then. We don't preach a whole lot of sermons about him, but yet here we are preaching about him today. And this is why. What does he bring to the table? What does he bring to the table? This is your final fill in the blank. The privilege of the pauper is adoption. It is his privilege to be adopted into the family. Look at the text here. It's a little long, but I wanted to read the whole thing for you. So David sent for him. David found out that this Mephibosheth lives somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. He sent for him and brought him to, uh, from Makir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show you kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. See, now I want you to know that Mephibosheth, when he, when he was found in Makir's home, when he was found and, and the report came that the king wants to see you, you know immediately what he was thinking. Mephibosheth showed up at the palace that day thinking he was going to get the axe. So he bows down to the ground, I am your servant, you know, thinking this is it. I'm done for. I've been found. Huh. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Instead, King David gives him all of his grandfather's property and wealth and belongings. He returns it to him. And then he says, and now from now on, 
you will sit at my table and share in my bounty. See, he thought he was going to get the ax, and instead he got grace. He was held in the grip of grace in that moment, not expecting it, but receiving it anyway. Uh, Chuck Swindoll wrote a hypothetical account of dinner at David's house, and, 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 and I wanted to share it with you because I think it's so neat. Uh, Max quoted it in his book, so, and I want to share it with you because this is really neat. Listen to this. The dinner bell rings through the king's palace, and David comes to the head of the table and sits down. In a few moments, Amnon, clever, crafty Amnon, sits to the left of David. Lovely and gracious Tamar, a charming and beautiful young woman, arrives and sits beside Amnon. And then across the way, Solomon walks slowly from his study, precocious, brilliant, preoccupied Solomon. The heir apparent slowly sits down, and then Absalom, handsome, winsome Absalom, with beautiful flowing hair, black as a raven, down to his shoulders, sits down. That particular evening, Joab, the courageous warrior and David's commander of the troops, has been invited to dinner. Muscular, bronzed Jake, uh, Joab is seated near the king. And afterward, they wait. They hear the shuffling of feet, the clump, clump, clump of the crutches of Mephibosheth rather awkwardly walks in and finds his place at the table and slips into his seat and the tablecloth covers his feet. I ask you, did Mephibosheth understand grace? Hmm. Did Mephibosheth understand grace? He who sat at the table with the king's own sons with the king's leader of his military. The son of the former one who wanted to kill David is sitting at the very same table. Did he understand grace? You bet he did. You bet he did. Mephibosheth had nothing to bring to the table, and yet he gets a seat there, adopted by the king. Why do I say he had nothing? Well, again, you have to understand the times that they lived in. As a cripple, Mephibosheth would not be allowed to work. He would not be allowed to worship. He would not be allowed in public squares because he was considered cursed. He would have to rely on the generosity of the public and perhaps some distant family members. He even lived on the fringes of society. He lived in a village called Lo Debar. Now, in, in the Bible, every name has a meaning and a reason for being called what it is. Lo Debar literally means no pasture, no word, or wasteland. It is also the same exact consonants that are used in the Hebrew word for not my son. And again, doesn't this fit in with the ideal earlier from our text? When we were utterly helpless. For Mephibosheth, when he was utterly helpless, King David stepped in and kept his promise. It's kind of a side of thought in this whole story, but really, not, not, not really. And, it, and it's so good that I, I want to share this idea with you. I find it interesting that in the scriptures, Mephibosheth is referred to as the cripple or a cripple up until David calls for him. And when David calls for him, he refers to him as this son or the son. He never refers to him as the cripple. He always refers to him as this son or the son. 
You see, Mephibosheth's stigma of his condition followed him wherever he went until the king adopted him into his family. How many of us walk around with an attached stigma to us? Every time your name is mentioned, not to you personally, by the way, but only when other people are talking about you, how many times every time that your name is mentioned, your calamity, your issue, your problem follows that name? Uh, let me give you some examples, and these are hypothetical. I pulled them out of the air, okay? Have you heard from John lately? You know, the fellow who got divorced. Here comes Susie Q., the little chatty girl from down the street, can't ever get her to shut up. We got a letter from Jerry. Remember him, the alcoholic? Sharon's in town. What a shame she has to raise all those kids by herself. I saw Melissa today. I don't understand why she can't keep a job. I got Billy in my class this year, you know, the little ADHD boy. Oh, boy. And on and on and on it can go. Friends, I'm here to tell you there's one who sees you for who you are and whose you are, not what you've done or what your condition is. I told you last week that we would talk about basking in God's glory. Well, here it is. When God speaks to you, when God speaks about you, he doesn't mention your dilemma, your plight, your pain, your problems. He doesn't mention any of that. He calls you son or daughter. When God refers to you, he refers to you as the son or the daughter. The prince or the princess, my children. And none of that stigma goes along with it. We get to bask in his glory. Just like David and Mephibosheth, David referred to him as the son, this son, and no longer referred to him as the cripple. Here's something so beautiful I want to share this with you. Max said this in his book, one word from the palace offsets a thousand voices in the streets. Oh, is that good? I'm going to say that one more time. One word from the palace, one word from the king, offsets a thousand voices from the streets. Don't let other people label you by what you have done or what has been your problem in the past. You are a son or a daughter of the God Most High. You bask in his glory, and that's what matters. So what are we to do with these thoughts today? Well, we have a gift for you this morning. In your bulletin, if you did not pick up a bulletin, I encourage you to pick one up on your way out. In your bulletin, there's a little hard card in there. Looks like this. It's a third sheet. At the top of it, it's labeled Privilege of Poppers Fringe Benefits Card. Whenever you're doubting yourself, whenever someone refers to you as your problem or your situation, whenever you just need to remember whose you are, you're having a Debbie Downer day, a doubtful Don day, pick this card up and read it. Here's what it says. You are beyond condemnation, Romans 8.1. You are delivered from the law, Romans 7, 6. You are near God, Ephesians 2, 13. You are delivered from the power of evil. You are a member of his kingdom. You are justified. You are perfect. You have been adopted. You have access to God at any moment. You are part of his priesthood. You will never be abandoned, and so on and so forth. It keeps going on down the line. Two pages of it, two sides. This is you. Not all the other junk. So if you're having a moment, pick this card up. Keep it with you. Put it in your Bible for your study, whatever, wherever, hang it on your refrigerator, on your bathroom mirror, I, wherever you put it to remind you who you are. Look at the back. 
on the thought for the day. This is from Romans chapter 11. We haven't gotten there yet, but this is Romans chapter 11 from the message version. It's a paraphrase, not a translation, so, but I loved it. Look at this. Have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant love of God, this deep, deep wisdom? It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God will ask, has to ask his advice? Everything comes from him. Everything go, uh, go, comes through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. You having a day? Pick it up. Read it. Repeat it. I encourage you to look up all of the, the texts. Prove to yourself just what God thinks of you. Use it daily. So, do you see humanity in this story that I've shared with you between David and Mephibosheth? Do you see yourself in that story? Isn't it interesting that both of them at one point suffered from weakness and needed help? And someone came through. We're all, friends, Mephibosheths, looking for someone to love us as much as David loved him. And we have found that someone. His name is Jesus. John 3.16 says it all. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he thinks of you as his son and daughter. There is no greater love than this. As paupers, we are adopted into God's family. And oh boy, what a family. And boy, what privileges we have as family members. Next week, grace works. Grace works. We're getting near the end of this sermon series. Only a couple of weeks left. Grace works in and how that understanding can have an immediate impact on our church today in this very moment. We'll talk about that next week. God bless you and thank you for listening. Amen. As our time together today begins to come to a close, we have the opportunity to live out our faith, to pray for one another, and to support one another. First prayer card today comes from Bubba. He's having foot surgery on August 31st. So we pray that it goes well and that you heal quickly, Bubba. Second one comes from the Fletter fam. They recently acquired a teenager in their household. Hannah's birthday was last weekend, so we celebrate along with you guys. Um, she turned 13 last Saturday, and we are praying that she continues to be the amazing young woman that she has always been, and that she continues to let her light shine for Jesus in this world. And then our final one today comes from Glennie Dornhag. And she says, praise God for all of his healing powers and blessings. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are amazing, and we are so incredibly thankful that we can be here together in your presence. Jesus, we know that you are with us, and we thank you for how you have been moving in this time and in this space that we are gathered here together. And I just ask that, that you help us to step out in courage to what you're calling us to do. Jesus, we know that, that you're challenging each and every one of us to dig deeper and to draw closer to you. So and I pray that you give us the courage to do that. Jesus, we also know that, that you are with us in the, in the good times and in the bad that you are with us when we have things to celebrate and things to be joyful over and, and blessings to, to celebrate along with you. And that you're also with us during times that are, are incredibly difficult, times when we need your healing, times when, when we're just down in the muck and we don't know how to get up. You are right there with us, Jesus, next to us, leading us further one step at a time. Jesus, thank you so much that, that you came to this earth and you showed us how to live 
taught us how to live a life on full. And we thank you so much for the grace that you give us. Jesus, we love you so much. And we pray that as we leave this time and this space, that we will meet you throughout this week. That we'll make the time to spend with you, to get to know your heart better, and to experience your grace for ourselves so that we can in turn give out that love and that grace freely to the people around us, not under our own power, but through you, overflowing what you have given us. Jesus, we love you, we celebrate you, and we thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Thanks, Jake. Um, let's continue our worship by standing and singing to the Lord and worshiping him in song. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Receive this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great day.